This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. We've talked a handful of times around here about whether the manufacturing sector is really that accessible to startups. If you've got some new technology and a young company that's managing it, is it really possible to sell it to big mainstream industrial companies? Those companies tend to be a little risk averse. They have incredibly expensive capital equipment with long replacement cycles. And all of that adds up to a pretty punishing sales process. There have been a few waves of interest in startups that address manufacturing, especially in the early 2010s, which was around the time that consumer 3D printing was hitting the market. There were some big acquisitions, like when Amazon bought Kiva in 2012 for more than $700 million. And in 2013 and 2014, when Andy Rubin's replicant group at Google was buying robotics companies like Boston Dynamics. That one went for about half a billion dollars. There's a lot of excitement around a handful of things. One was the increase in processing power that was becoming available both locally on embedded systems and in the cloud, accessible through broadband internet connections. There was also the emergence of inexpensive hardware components, especially sensors and actuators that you might find in mobile phones or other consumer devices, and that had become a lot less expensive. And of course, there was the emergence of China as a really accessible manufacturing ecosystem, where you could go with an idea and get something made quickly and inexpensively. A lot of startups that set out to address manufacturing in that era didn't work out, and they often pointed as causes to the factors that I mentioned earlier, that the big industrial companies that represent a lot of that market are difficult to sell to. Now I think there's a renewed interest in manufacturing as an area that startups can address. And there's a new generation of technology companies that's a bit more fully grounded in the culture and practices of manufacturing. On today's episode, we have a conversation with a VC who's invested in a handful of these newer generation manufacturing startups. Before we get into that discussion, I'd like to remind you that the Digital Factory Conference is coming on May 7 in Boston. It's hosted by Jeff Immelt, and speakers include the CEO of Spirit Aerosystems, as well as the CEO of Align Technology, and the CIO of FedEx, the CTO of GE, the CIO of Baker Hughes, and the founders of both Formlabs and Desktop Metal. To register, visit thedigitalfactory.com and use the code podcast for a discount. The Digital Factory is a production of Formlabs, which makes powerful, reliable, and flexible 3D printers that scale from desktop prototyping into full production. You can learn more about Formlabs at formlabs.com. My guest today is Dana Grayson. She's a partner at NEA, where she's led investments in a handful of really interesting manufacturing startups, including, of course, Formlabs, as well as Desktop Metal, Onshape, Tulip, and Upskill. Dana, it's great to have you on the program. It's great to be here. Thanks, John. So tell me about what got you interested in this field. What did you see changing about manufacturing and about the technology that goes into it that made you feel that now is the right time to take these positions? Sure. And if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll, I'll kind of explain because it was, a, it was a meandering road. We'd like to think as venture capitalists that we have this crystal ball that tells us how things are going to play out dec decades from now. But in actuality, we kind of follow it step change at a time. But generally, you know, I have an overarching thesis that there are periods of development of new core technologies, and then there are periods of implementation of these new core technologies. And there's, in fact, um, a book of, called AI Superpowers that talks about this very uh, change from development to implementation for things such as AI. And that's what mm -hmm. led me to the changes in industrial. Overarchingly, manufacturing is part of the industrial space. I saw that there are ways that large industrial companies can change the way they're doing manufacturing through the use of big data, through the use of AI and machine learning. But how exactly that would be implemented is still, you know, largely to be seen today. And so I first invested in a company called Onshape, which you know, which is a CAD design tool. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not only a CAD design tool, but it's a large uh, development platform for the design world. And I saw how you know, the use of data was really core to any design platform. And it got me thinking, you know, after we invested in Onshape, like how, how the use of big data will actually transform all of manufacturing. We've seen companies like Uptake, which we're already inve also invested in, 
uh, kind of ingest data from many different sensors, many different inputs, and we're still, you know, it's still yet to be seen exactly how that's going to change the manufacturing landscape. But I think we're entering now a period of implementation of these new technologies, AI in particular, in the manufacturing world. The other big trend that I've noticed in the manufacturing space, or here we go talking about additive manufacturing specifically with form labs and desktop metal is the miniaturization and the commoditization of these technologies. So, you know, you take the development and the implementation phases, which I've just talked about, and you couple it with, you know, a form of Moore's law in the manufacturing mm -hmm. world, you know, the really shrinking of, of these tools and technologies and how they can be applied. And suddenly you've got, you know, a 3D printing machine that used to be the size of a half of room mm -hmm. and you've taken it now to something that can be on your desktop. In the case of Form Labs, that's a $3,000 printer compared to a couple hundred thousand dollar printer. And the same mm -hmm. thing in, mm -hmm. in the case of desktop metal, you know, a, a printer for metals, but a different scale, same sort of um, miniaturization happening. And finally, the other trend that's happening in the manufacturing space is the change in business models. So, mm -hmm. you know, I first saw this again with Onshape that you could actually sell not only cloud-based technology, but you could sell subscription-based uh, billing systems. You know, a subscription business model can be applied in the manufacturing world. That's had huge implications as you've seen in the software world. Uh, SaaS in particular, SaaS changed enterprise software uh, forever <laughs> back in the mm -hmm. in the early 2000s with the advent of Salesforce. They were the ones that really first declared software was dead. And I think that same sort of land and expand model can be applied in manufacturing. And we're just starting to see the beginning of that. So we're in very, very early innings. But for the first time ever, and this is what I think, by the way, it's really cool about your digital factory conference. The first time ever, some of the buyers of these new technologies can be process engineers, can be plant managers, where they're buying new technology for budgets that fit into their disposable budgets every year for $5,000, $10,000. And they can try these things on the manufacturing line. They can try these in many different factories. They can see how they work. And then they can hopefully expand the technologies um, throughout the organization. That's really the same model that we saw happen with SaaS-based software. Mm -hmm. You get in with just a marketing manager, let's say, or a sales person you know, who starts using Salesforce back in 2003, and then it slowly takes over an organization. That is a, a huge change in the manufacturing world. It's, like I said, still to happen, but we're seeing the beginnings of that. And as investors, as venture capitalists, those changes are what we really pay attention to. So the change in a potential business model, the change in core technology going into a new implementation phase, it's ready for that, AI in particular, making sense of the big data that we've uh, we've had at our fingertips for a decade now. And, and then thirdly, the miniaturization of the technology and the commoditization of it. Those three factors really open up a whole new um, change in manufacturing that I think we're, you know, just at the beginning of, say, a 40-year period of change in the industrial world. That change in the business model that you mentioned now, where you can go and sell a fairly inexpensive subscription product to a frontline uh, user, begins to address one of the controversies that you get into when you talk with people who follow startups that address the industrial space, is can startups address the industrial space, right? Industrial companies are tend to be very conservative, uh, very risk averse. They want to deal with you know the big, uh, reliable partners that they've dealt with always. And often uh, trying to sell into them is a little difficult. But you've, you've just identified this really key change that means that you don't have to sell a you know, $200,000 piece of hardware to an industrial company in order to get in there. You can start to sell a few hundred bucks a month or, or a few hundred bucks a year and then expand as you go in. Right, exactly. And, and we saw that again in the software space. And you know, as venture capitalists, we... We love new technologies. We geek out on new ways to do things, but we also are really excited by patterns of recognition. So when we see the same change happening um, that happened in software to the industrial space, we, we start to pay attention. Over the years of, of SaaS really um, being exciting for NEA as a category, we came to hate words like enterprise sales cycles uh -huh, and uh -huh. uh, going through the CIO to get to an organization. We love models that can really 
you know, grow with user adoption versus grow with, you know, big transformations. So the industrial world, I've come to hate words like digital transformation or pilots or proof of proofs of uh -huh. concept. Those have to happen eventually to, you know, to reformat a whole factory floor, but they don't have to happen if you just want to try um, new processes on a particular uh, new product that you're developing or a new, you know, way of, of getting one product out to market. I think this is also the beginning of what I hope will change actually the way uh, products are produced. This again, is probably a 40 year transformation, but you know, when you can, when you can commoditize the production methods, when you can unleash the power of data, when you can change the way that this is adopted and built for, you can imagine, whole factories being reimagined where they are they're local they're right out your back door they're a tenth or a hundredth of the size of what they used to be and i think that's that's sort of the beginning of what we're what we're paying most attention to right when you look at successful startups in this kind of area um what do you notice about them culturally this is another question that you wind up talking about a lot with respect to startups that address uh, the industrial space you know, do you need founders or, or top managers who come from heavy industry and are able to speak a particular language? Or can you go into it with the same kind of open field that you would go into, say, building a web app? Well, there's certainly deep technical underpinnings in the founding team. So uh, we've seen, obviously, <laughs> uh, a lot of great technology come out of MIT. So, mm -hmm. you know, Max and team at Formlabs, all of the team at Desktop Metal, um, a number of these of these engineers to start the companies come out of big institutions like MIT because, you know, look at the core technology that Max and team, you know, discovered with Formlabs, the, the galvanometer, and how you could mm -hmm. shrink that down. And actually, that led to the whole shrinking of, of the size of their printer and the cost, in particular, of the size, uh, the cost of their printer could then come down. That's a core technology that, you know, all of Formlabs was originally based around the market, how it's sold. Those are all benefits that uh, that technology enabled, but it wasn't what they created the business around. Uh, Max mm -hmm. knew this technology was different. He didn't exactly know what it would result in. In fact, you know, Formlabs and a lot of the 3D printing space over the past decade thought they were going to start in the consumer space. And mm -hmm. turns out, you know, consumers... Uh, consume a lot of things. 3D <laughs> printing is not one of them, uh, right, right. but that's okay because the industrial world is a much more exciting world to to disrupt and and transform with 3D printing. And kudos to companies like Formlabs that really followed that market. So, in, in terms of your question, what do founding teams need? They need that core technical underpinning, I think, in the industrial space. They also need the ability to shift and change and iterate very, very quickly. So whether it's my industrial investments or even some of my consumer investments, I look for teams that can try things quickly, listen to the market, watch what their technology can and cannot do, and shift it accordingly very, very quickly. It's the founding teams that kind of stick to one thing and just say, this is what we set out to build and this is what we're going to build that frankly, you know, often end up failing because they don't mm -hmm. shift and follow a market fast enough. So if you can get that nimbleness in your team uh, coupled with the core technology, I think that's a really, really, really exciting combination. You mentioned a moment ago a pretty significant uh, vision for the future of manufacturing where it's really transformed by these digital tools. Um, in the successful startup teams that you talk to, are they generally focused on that sort of long-term vision of transforming manufacturing? And, and if so, how do they keep that from getting in the way of, uh, you know, speaking the day-to-day -day language of end users and industrial companies who have much shorter range goals? I mean, yes and no. I think, you know, I think the, the greatest entrepreneurs, you know, uh, Max included and Rick included at Desktop Metal, see the long-term potential of what they're doing, but they're not out to change the whole sector, um, correct? You know, they they may they may beg to differ with me. They may say they absolutely <laughs> are going to change the world, and I think they will change the world. By the way, but I think they're doing it one step of a, a time. You know, great entrepreneurs kind of see the end goal might be a decade from now, but they have to they have to actually you know get a product to market. It's the it's the reality of hardware <laughs> hardware mm -hmm. in particular. Um, 
really brings an entrepreneur back down to earth very quickly when you have to build a product, ship a product, uh, scale a product, implement a product over and over again. Um, and so long term, I think absolutely uh, form labs will transform. They already are transforming things like the dental industry. I think automotive will be another space that additive manufacturing will change dramatically. Ultimately, I think all of manufacturing will change, but again, it could be a 40 year period and uh, a lot of exciting companies can be built in the interim. For example, I, you know, I would also say that the market for um, additive manufacturing in how it's being applied is probably only really, you know, in terms of the spending, about six or seven, maybe eight billion dollars this year will be spent on additive manufacturing. That's less than a half a point of the whole mm -hmm. uh, market size of manufacturing technology. So, um, but that in itself could could harbor, you know, one or two very successful companies over the next two years. But we're it's, it's super, super early, but I think it can be done. Yeah. That, that half a percent of a point is the, uh, is the opportunity, right? Exactly. So aside from these, uh, industrial focused companies that we've mentioned, you've also led investments in, uh, some other companies that kind of reach across into the physical world, like FrameBridge, which offers custom framing and uh, glam squad that, that offers in-home, uh, beauty styling. Do you, do you see the same kinds of things driving those investments or is that a completely different segment of your brain? Well, I do think both of those uh, companies, especially Framebridge, which which does a large amount of manufacturing themselves, so there is a, a lot of overlap between what I see in the industrial or the manufacturing space and what Framebridge is doing. They are a vertically integrated uh, consumer company. So the overlap between some of my industrial investments and my consumer investments is that everything I invest in, I try to to really see what is the end use application of this technology. I don't like to get too far away from the end user, whether it's an enterprise user on the automotive shop floor or a consumer, you know, purchasing frames in the case of Framebridge. I like to see how this will have immediate value um, to how it's applied. And mm -hmm. that's sort of, you know, it, it's sort of obvious, but at the same time, there's another whole investing strategy that we sometimes partake in at NEA that's really down at the infrastructure level of new technologies or the AI level that we talked about before about how these, these new technologies are being developed. And that's very, very interesting and can be very valuable as well. But it's just more of a personal, personal style thing that I like to mm -hmm. see. You know, I'm a product person really by background. So I, I obsess about how these products are actually being developed and designed and um, how quickly they can be appreciated in the marketplace. And that's why I kind of stick to the uh, industrial hardware space and the consumer space. Speaking of your background as a product person, um, you're, you're an engineer by training uh, and you transitioned uh, into VC. I'm curious about what, what sort of motivated that transition and um, how you take the perspective that you developed as an engineer and bring it into your work as an investor? Sure, I think I think venture capital versus um, other financial investing careers that are you know maybe private equity, certainly hedge funds uh, in the in the public markets. Venture capital is really, in, by my definition, a partnership with entrepreneurs. And in order to truly partner with entrepreneurs, there's a few things you need. You need patience, you need understanding, you need empathy of what it actually takes in day in and day out to create new products. And for me, you know, having come from the product side or for anyone that's been on the product or the operational or the engineering side, I think it gives you a whole new appreciation of how hard it is to actually mm -hmm. develop groundbreaking technologies that nobody has literally ever done before. Um, it's not just about creating a vision, creating a whiteboard, uh, developing it and releasing a product. There are you know, many more circuitous routes of day in and day out of failures, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, failures based on the technology, failures based on hiring, failures based on timelines. Um, and having that understanding from, you know, really having developed products before, I think gives you a whole another level of insight into what it takes to build companies. Um, it's not uncommon to see people that have operational backgrounds you know, go into venture capital. There are many other ways into venture capital too. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, there's no pattern of success. Some people are great journalists and then they come over into the venture capital side. But for me, um, it gave me a whole nother set of 
understanding and um, and also uh, an ability to recognize great technologists that can do things um, in an unbelievable amount of time. Now that you've kind of moved over and you find yourself giving uh, advice back to other people who are kind of engineers building products and building companies, what's the most common advice that you find yourself giving to the uh, CEOs you back? I listen hard, first of all. I, I don't just give advice. I think every situation is very different. Every product is different. Everything that they're setting out to change is unique. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth doing for them or or for me. Mm-hmm. I think the most common set of advice that I give to anyone is just to listen to your market and to act quickly. So they are the experts, the entrepreneurs that I work with, they're the experts on their market. They're closer to it day in and day out. There's no body of research. There are no analyst reports. There are no Uh um, things that are going to guide what they're doing. They just have to listen hard to the market and listen hard to their own technology teams about what is possible to bring to market. So the only ability that they really have to surpass incumbents and competitors in the market is speed. They have Mm -hmm. to listen hard and change quickly if things aren't working or change quickly if things frankly are working and follow that change. So my advice to them is always just to listen and, and act quickly based on, based on what you're seeing. And in the industrial segment that we're talking about, once again, that's, that's the salient thing, right? Where you're surrounded by older companies that are perhaps a little bit more risk averse, a little bit harder to, to turn quickly. That's an immense advantage. Right, exactly. And it's hard to do. It's harder to do, um, in the industrial space than in other software driven spaces because you're actually dealing with real hardware. I've also seen, I think one of the pitfalls of um, industrial entrepreneurs is that they get obsessed. They could get over obsessed with a technology and saying, you know, robotics, for example, this, this robot could change the factory floor. It could change the factory floor, Mm -hmm. you know, taking a hypothetical example, but that all depends on what is the daily sort of benefit that you provide to the factory floor. And so if you, if you're too far away from the customer, the end user, um, you can go down the pig path, if you'll call it that, of, of technology for technology's sake in the industrial world very easily because these technologies are so hard to develop. They do take a long time, but if they don't provide immediate benefit, they'll never be adopted. And so uh, that that's something I look for in, in the industrial spaces. Are the entrepreneurs really understanding how quickly these things can be adopted or is it really technology for technology's sake? Dana, I'd like to move on to the question that I ask every guest on this program. What is your favorite tool? My favorite tool is actually a, a device that one of my partners here was a, a founding creator of, and that is something called the Corvin. It's the wine um, opener and uh, where you can actually you know, insert the needle through the cork and get to the wine. I hesitate to use this example because it's related to wine and alcohol. I have other <laughs> favorite things outside sure, of sure. those two categories. But uh, Josh Makar is a, is a brilliant inventor and um, I, I, I take great pleasure of using it because I, I know the team that invented it, even though it wasn't a, any investment. But it's a really cool mechanical device, right? And it uh, is this the one that injects uh, an inert gas into the bottle? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So it, it doesn't disrupt the quality of the wine. It's like this this very sophisticated system for addressing the problem of opening a bottle of wine. <laughs> and exactly. I guess it, it improves the experience, right? <laughs> right, right. It improves the experience. It, it doesn't disrupt the quality of the wine. And it doesn't, you know, I guess if you just want to have a glass of wine, you don't have to open the whole whole bottle. So it's a, it's a tool for moderation in wine, I suppose, as well. Moderation, quality, access. Awesome. Well, Dana, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. If listeners want to find you online, uh, where should they look? Twitter is a great place. It's probably where I'm most active, although you can also find me on the NEA page, LinkedIn, and other places. Excellent. Dana Grayson, it's been great talking with you. Thanks again for coming on the program. All right. Thank you. Dana is a speaker at the Digital Factory Conference coming up on May 7 in Boston. If you want to learn more about this program for manufacturing leaders, visit thedigitalfactory.com. And when you register, use the code PODCAST for a discount. The Digital Factory is a production of Formlabs, which makes powerful, reliable, and flexible 3D printers that scale from desktop prototyping to full production. Learn more at formlabs.com. For the Digital Factory podcast, I'm John Bruner.